Good morning and welcome to Tim Pendrell, Legislative Candidate from District 7. Thank you, Tim, for joining us for our virtual Legislative Candidate meetings. My name is Gina Raglan and joining me today is Susan DeCamp, Volunteer State President, and Advocacy Lead Volunteers Joyce Beck and Mike Barwig. Tim, we appreciate your taking the time to meet and discuss issues of importance to the 50 plus voter and their families in Nebraska. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be shared with AARP members across your district prior to the election. So to start us off, Tim, if you don't mind giving us a little background about yourself and your campaign and maybe keeping that to five minutes or less would be great. Once we've completed your opening, we'll move into the questions. So welcome, Tim, and thank you. Cool. Yeah, yeah um, Tim Pendra grew up in South Omaha, got involved in um, community work when I was in high school in the late 90s. Um, there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on, but um, mainly it was South Omaha graffiti wipeout. We had a lot of gang issues um, around that time when I was in school. Um, that's kind of the first time I, I got involved and got addicted to public service and met my first elected officials and all that stuff during during that event. Um, so I ended up I ended up spirit doing a year of AmeriCorps, a year of public service with Habitat for Humanity of Omaha. Um, was doing that. Um, their office used to be at 22nd Ames. They've moved, but still up in the general area. So I, I really got interested in the early 2000s when they started talking about, you know, caring about the community more. A lot of urban design elements were being brought in after they got rid of the land out, um, out by the old AT&T plant. Um, so I ended up going to get my master's urban planning, um, focused on economic development, housing policy, um, always with the goal to come back here and make the community better. Um, finally was able to get back to Nebraska, worked for the Department of Corrections, doing the vocational life skills program for a couple of years. Um, I was their grant administrator, so all of our federal grants, Department of Education grants, and then um, helping people um, coming out of corrections get back involved into the community. Um, had accounting access with the state, saw a lot of a lot of problems and a lot of issues so through a mutual friend i got the opportunity to come over and work in the in the legislature and i've been working there since 2019 um with senator mcdonald um and the main thing was it was the he was on the appropriations committee and i wanted to work sp specifically on the state budget because there were well there's still a lot of issues there um, and then while I was doing that, he he became chair of the retirement committee, and that's when I took over as committee clerk for the Nebraska Retirement Systems Committee. And with the senators were losing and term limits, um, that's when I really decided I needed to run. Um, I think there's 15 senators that will turn over, and I remember the four special sessions of the 2000s because new governor comes in, gets the new budget that he wants and then oops kind of messed it up then there's usually a special session where we have to cut everything um when i was look researching the issues some we had a corrections based on a state audit they all went they all they all track traced back to that first special session under governor johans so you're looking at issues that are now 22 years old that have not been corrected yet um and yes yeah, so i'm running because i know where a lot of those are not all of them but it does it doesn't come up in appropriations hearings with the agencies and the most startling thing was um the department of corrections was unaware of most of their not most but some of their cash accounts so that's that's it in a nutshell the district is downtown little italy um kind of around spring lake going down into south omaha well, thank you, Tim, and thanks for your public service in the legislature and all the things that you've done prior to that. We appreciate you very much. Uh, we're going to move now into the question section. And again, we provided you with a set of three questions pertaining to the 50 plus in Nebraska. We're allotting, again, five minutes for each of those questions just uh, because of time constraints. Um, our first question this morning is on health, caregiving, and home and community-based care, and it comes from Joyce Beck. So go ahead, Joyce. Good morning, Tim, and thank you so much for your time. It sounds like you have a wonderful background. Uh, it's very interesting to hear about you. So thank you for taking the time to give us that background. 84% of Nebraskans over 45 say that staying in their homes as they get older is extremely important to them. Home and community-based services and area agencies on aging become important assets to caregivers as they care for their loved ones. Home care not only meets the needs of their loved ones, but it also provides relief to an already strained long-term care industry. So Tim, I have a couple of questions for you. The first one is, 
what would you do to protect or expand the home and community-based programs, particularly recruitment and retention of sufficient staff and, out, and adequate funding for the programs and services that older Nebraskans and their families rely on? And then my second question is, what will you do to support the 179,000 unpaid family caregivers in Nebraska? Yes, I think one of the supporting community-based services is always the priority and home-based services. Um, just did this, you know, with my mom where basically we got her a, an assisted dwelling unit so she could stay with my brother and not, and still be able to, she can still function, but that that's the reason why. Um, a lot of it is making sure we have the proper as far as the legislature can help is just making sure we have the proper rates um, and provider rates and making sure that money is not cut and the other senators understand how the, the financing works for that. Um, I was in one meeting and they're talking about how everybody looks at the, you know, these outlandish profits some groups are making, but they're based on national numbers and the costs are very different. Um, the costs in Omaha are gonna be the cost, different costs than rural. And one of the issues, like as far as recruitment and retaining, when we had, um, so when I started in legislature 2019, we were able to get some tours before the pandemic. And we went and met with, um, you know, I got a tour of like UNMC and Nebraska Medicine. About 70% of their staff was retirement age and planning to retire in the next five years. And then we hit a global pandemic and everybody just did it then. This is a surprise. We've known we've, this has been coming for a decade, but now not only do we have to make the jobs attractive, make the careers attractive, we need to make it easier. We need to make the pay better. And honestly, for home care, it's cheaper than the alternative. We should be investing more to make it a realistic place for people to do the work, both in Omaha and throughout the state, um, because that's that's been our biggest challenges. We're not competitive in wages as much as we like to talk like we are. We're we're not. And we're not looking at um we're not using the right comparables. Like if I was paying more than Nebraska and South Dakota's paying more in Nebraska, yeah, they're very close, but we're looking at it more nationally. So I, I rarely like the the states we use for for our rates and kind of our comparisons because they're not, we have a crisis. We actually have to recruit a lot more people than we have because we have a much larger retiring age than we do a working age right now. And then the other part of that is just, you know, I'm big, big support of assisted dwelling units. We did a, a bill in the legislature to fund a prototype one that um, University of Nebraska Omaha's building with um, UNMC that would actually have detectors in the building so that they could like, be able to tell whether or not um, somebody fell or had a stroke without somebody necessarily being there all the time and making laws available so that you can have more multi-generational families. So like as property taxes go up, people aren't being forced out of their house, but maybe the second generation can take over and keep the family together, which would also go into community-based services being available and achievable. And I, I just think it's a cheaper alternative and a better alternative. And I don't thank know if I answered so both questions. You, you, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tim. Our second question now, we're going to switch over to a different topic of consumer fraud, exploitation, and protections. And Mike Barwick's going to take that. So go ahead, Mike. Good morning, Tim. Scammers are increasingly targeting older adults with scams such as wire transfers, gift card scams, and schemes involving real property. Nationwide, the average victim of elder fraud lost nearly $34,000 due to these crimes in 2023. And in Nebraska, the FTC showed that there were 4,643 fraud reports made. Nearly 9 in 10 consumers agree that lawmakers need to do more to protect consumers from fraud and scams. With that in mind, our questions for you are... Consumers lose billions of dollars each year to online financial, property, and other types of fraud. What will you do to address and ensure that Nebraskans are protected against fraud and deceptive or unfair business practices and provide opportunities for redress to victims of fraud? 
In other words, would you support, one, enacting laws to require merchants that sell gift cards to post notices? Two, enactment of a consumer fraud restitution fund? Or three, implementation of preventative or corrective measures to assist in combating owner-seller housing impersonation fraud? Well, yes, on all, all three. It's getting harder to tell. Um, it's easier to get scammed right now. And like, I, I basically don't trust any text or email I get anymore. Cause I just cannot, I can't tell the difference a lot of these times. Um, and so it is getting easier. Um, laws require merchants to sell gift cards, um, the post notices. I think anything to post notices, anything that can secure the trust and what's being sold is real and coming from a real number or email um any way to kind of make that more transparent and trustworthy um through legislation or even technology would 100 percent support um consumer fraud restitution son yeah i would we have the state has a lot of money a lot of those cash funds um finding potentially through like almost like settlements and um law enforcement creating that fund we have similar things like that i need to talk to the the courts to figure out how how we could get how we could actually set that up um but as far as the state just setting it up and making money eligible and putting money over there i'd really like it if when somebody got arrested um or caught doing scam that that could be a percentage of those court fees or something could be put into that restitution fund um because those funds actually do a very good job of being invested and they grow quite a bit. Um, total cash agency funds when I started in the legislature in 2019 were 3.7 billion. At the end of the last month I checked, which was the end of June, it was 9.5 billion. Um, a lot of that's just been the investments of the investment commission. So I do think a fund could be set up maybe with the either the treasurer's office or the attorney general's office um, to, to help people who've been scammed. And then with um, corrective measures combating, yeah, impersonation fraud, it's it's tough. Like it's because it's almost like whatever we do, there's a way to get around it, and it's there's always there's always a new way, a new way to get around. It. I mean, there's I know I know cybersecurity people who've been um, tricked very recently, um, but I think anything that anything that can be done to make it a verified transaction, make it an easy way to see it, and even making it so that no money can change hands until there's a verification process. Um, that's the tough. But the tough part is, like, it just keeps coming. It's like every time you, you stop one, one scam and one fraud, they're just going to find a way around it. It's like whack-a-mole. Um, so I think the the restitution fund and then also making sure we're really strong and being able to go after after people who are who are running scams and then any way we could create working with companies that would would have a measured way of verification that you could kind of like they used to do with like even just like better business bureau and you know something that that there's almost like a third party way to check whether or not something's real or not real um Usually, I'm just assuming is it's not real. Yeah. Well, thank you for your answers. Thank you, Tim, and definitely, I, I, I'm intrigued with your comments and your suggestions. The fraud restitution fund that is some things that have been happening nationally, um, and then again, it is creating that separate fund. And so, I definitely, we would love to have further conversations with you when you get to the legislature on some legislation on that. So, thank you for your commitment and interest in those subject areas. Um, our last question now switches over to our livable communities, helping people stay in their homes and communities. And Susan DeCamp is going to take that. Good morning, Tim. It's nice to have you with us today. Um, sounds like from your introduction that this question will probably pr be pretty easy for you with your experience in housing. So we're going to talk with a two part question. We'll talk a little bit first about housing. And then the second part just talks a little bit about taxes like homestead exemptions. So Nebraskans are over over 65 are the fastest growing segment of our population. And research shows that most of them want to remain in their homes and communities as they age. 
As housing costs continue to increase, older adults are unable to find housing to meet their needs when seeking to downsize, and thus they're being pushed out of communities and homes that they have lived in for generations. What would you do to support, incentivize, and ensure the creation of affordable and diverse housing options, such as accessory dwelling units or ADUs, as you know, um, intergenerational housing, manufactured housing, housing units, and townhouses. And then the second question is, will you fight to ensure that the homestead exemption program is maintained and protected to ensure that older Nebraskans that qualify for this continue to have access to the tax relief program that allows them to age in place? Yeah, with the second one, homestead exemptions, definitely. Um, I think people have lived in their homes long enough and retired here, um, wanting to keep them in their house as long as possible. Um, all the other issues are pretty much very similar to just issues of housing affordability to begin with. Um, it kind of big, high, well, I live down here in Little Italy, Little Bohemia, and you, you the, the second houses are all over the place. Um, they're no longer second houses, but there's, you know, it's a working class um, neighborhood for over a hundred years and you can, and it's had many generations. So you can see where the, like the working houses are that are really face the back alleys. Um, and it's nice because it gets you more density. It keeps the housing stock a little bit more affordable um, with, with people who've been living in their houses the Asian community in California was really the leaders because all the zoning in California didn't allow for any of it. And then they just realized really quickly that they were the majority and laws changed immediately once they just said, no, we're not, we're not, we're going to build assisted dwelling units. We're going to put our family in there and it's their multi-generational cultures. So that's definitely taken over the West, West Coast and a lot of those communities. City of Lincoln has put in, uh, in their zoning, they've put in um, preference for assisted dwelling units with uh, multi-generational families and gave it a way to get around the, um, the zoning rules. Here in Omaha, it's there's more popularity for it right now where the city's about to do their master plan which will be the first time since the 90s so that will hopefully have a lot of options for assisted accessory dwelling units and one of the ways around it was looking at how the asian american community did it because you also have the the pushback is that we're going to put too much too much population in neighborhoods that weren't built for it which where i'm at's not true this neighborhood was built for it it's designed for it um there are other neighborhoods where it, there may not be enough parking right now, but the way around was to make it that it's for families. It's for it's for when the same family or the original homeowner wants to stay on the property but wants to downsize, because we also want to encourage the downsizing when it's available because you want to create more more housing availability so that people like don't have to move have two houses when they only need one. Um, and not having to sell the house because that's, you know, we want to keep those houses and families as long as possible. So I think those two combined um, do go together and they they hit a lot of the needs of just the city and cities in general where, where we do want to increase density because it makes public transit more um, possible, makes it more viable, um, makes community stronger, and it also reduces sprawl, which is very damaging because that's where our traffic comes from. It's from people who can't, who have to drive downtown. Um, I have senior housing right around the corner from me, and they've the city's made it more dangerous. They've they've made the they've made crossing the street harder, and they've increased the speed of traffic in an effort to do the opposite. Which we see a lot of that in Omaha. Um, it's not not so much national. Um, a lot of my friends are running the transportation in other cities, and I tell them what just happened, and I'm like, did I miss a memo? And they're like, no, you never do that. And I'm like, okay, we did it. We're doing it all over the place. Um, so yeah, you just the Victory Housing down on 10th Street, and then the the senior living right there, they've, they've made it quite hard to cross there. Um, so more, getting more assisted dwelling, and then with manufactured homes, 
they're I don't like how they basically are the thing that kills them is that they don't they're depreciating values like vehicles and I think the main reason is, is because they don't have like a fixed basement but figuring that out because that messes up the whole mortgage structure to where you can't get them on a on a 30 year so they're financed different getting a way around that to where the other things that come in with a home as far as like being insured being able to keep the payments low um in general I'm in favor of them that's just always been the case is that they're they don't appreciate value like a like a single family home that's probably not built as well but because it fits into our concept of a 30 year mortgage and the um you know the housing development post world war 2 boom that's always been the issue with manufactured homes. They can be built better, stronger, but because they're essentially treated like vehicles, they they just it makes it harder to advise buying one. But then when it comes to assisted dwelling units, it doesn't matter as much because it's attached to another property. Um, and then townhomes, yeah, the more density, the better. Um, I'm it just drives me crazy how much the townhomes are going because they're supposed to be cheaper because you fit more property on one lot, but like a uh, Five hundred fifty thousand dollar townhome isn't exactly helping uh, me buy a house. Um, I, I would rent one; it'd probably be just fine. But yeah, the idea with density in townhomes is that you're supposed to be able to fit more housing more efficiently on one lot, and those are supposed to be cheaper, not more expensive than the alternative. But right now, now rural, I don't think it would be the case. I think if you you know you get into a smaller community and build more houses on one lot, those would be affordable. But here they're being built more as um, almost like luxury, high-end kind of concepts for people who want to live urban, which is great. But it's not a it's not impacting home ownership cost as much as we'd like it to. Great, thank you, Tim, for sharing your thoughts and insight on that issue. Thank you, Tim, and I'm thrilled that you know what an ADU is because many people do not. And so also exciting to hear that you actually have a personal experience with your mom um, in one, you know, living with your brother. So um, and it, this is a high priority area for high priority area for ARP and, and affordable housing in that. So, again, another area where we would look forward to working with you um, once you get into the legislature, moving some things forward. Um, so we are coming to the end of our meeting time. And so in closing, I'd like to give you back a few minutes, Tim, to talk about what your priorities are for serving in the legislature, or if you have any specific issues that you plan to work on or address during the time as a state senator that maybe you haven't talked about or you want to expand on. So I'll give you a, a few minutes back to close out. Yeah, my main thing is, let's make sure I got everything. Um, you know, the, the main thing is like, a lot of it's public safety, a lot of it's economic developments, by far what I'm most interested in, and that that does tie over in housing. Um, you know, I've been getting a lot of the people I've been meeting, you know, Nebraska's number one in the country in um, refugees per capita. Um, South Omaha has traditionally been um, immigrant community, new people coming in. And then even working with like, you know, we have over 4,000 Mayans living in Omaha and they're, they're freaking cool. Um, and then looking at back when I was in grad school, one of the things I worked on was doing culinary incubators where you can create these food type businesses, which right now you see where somebody will be selling like, you know, tamales or, um, you know, spaghetti and they're doing it illegally. We don't say nothing because the food's way better and it's for like a little family fundraiser. Um, but we have a huge shortage in Nebraska on co-packing. So if you go down to, um, let's see, we're about to hit Applejack weekend, go down to Kimmel Orchard, go down to Arbor Day and flip those jars around to look where they're made. They're made in states that invested in like local foods and local, um, local co-packing. A lot of those products are coming out of Nebraska, have to go to Michigan to get canned and jarred to come back here and then be sold. So I've been 20 year plus years, I've been talking about how we need to build more co-packing facilities, culinary incubators, but more so that like, in my district, right around here, a lot of the old um, the Italian restaurants have closed because the third and fourth generation doesn't want to be in the business, or at least if they are, they want to do it like Coniglia is out west where they're going to make a fortune because there's more people and, you know, that's OK, that's where the neighborhood moved to. But, um, well, the kids. But like to be able to preserve those family recipes and be able to not only preserve them, but to be able to have them 
you know, sold in a museum and sold in stores. And then a lot of these new immigrant groups being able to like legally manufacture their products with the goal of getting it on store shelves at high V and building that wealth. I've been working on that for over like 20 years and now running, I'm starting to meet the people who, who are like understanding how that would work because of the ones that do these food businesses. So that's like something that is building momentum because people are getting kind of excited about because I'm working with enough people who understand how that would impact specifically South Omaha. Um, but then like even just kind of piggybacking on that as we go through and look at a lot of these opportunities and issues, 67% of the kids in Omaha public schools that are in advanced placement courses, um, they're not, they're not white. They're, they're Latino. They're, they're a lot of them are immigrant. A lot of them are refugees. And I, I know Kansas city knows this, they're being recruited to leave the state and we're, we're just going to be finding more challenges if we keep losing more, more people. And so finding ways. So like when I was coming out of high school and that opportunity came where I realized we can build this community however we want it to be. I want a lot of those kids to understand that because if we we just need to keep like one class here, like the class of 2007 stays, um, that transforms our economy and it would really, really help going forward. Um, so I think those those are kind of the big, big things I've been working on. Um, issue that's been coming up the most is 13th Street, 20th Street, street racing. It's every night. Um, I'm not invited to the party, but it's like, I'm going to, like, I grew up, I was born at like 37th and um, Harrison street. And I'm probably going to die trying to cross 13th street one of these days. Cause it's, it's bad. Um, so those are the issues that come up downtown. We have a lot of empty nesters and none of the, the parkland and none of the investments are targeted for, for the population. That's actually the fastest growing downtown. Um, so like there's, there's issues like that where we're just trying to find opportunities to, kind of have everything a person would want in any type of housing scenario to be available for them wherever they live and different areas that that looks a little bit different but even figure out how to make that viable and how to have the financing and the incentives so that communities um, around the state can do that those are the things i work on and think about with the budget Thank you, Tim. I appreciate your concepts of especially on the livable community side of things um, again really excited to work with you in the future and some of those issues. Um, we are at the end of our time. So again, I wanna thank you for taking the time to visit with us. We wish you the best with your campaign. And most importantly, thank you for meeting with ARP today. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Tim. Bye. Bye. All right.